Hey guys, it's Conrad Bobby Lake here, CEO of Investors Prime Real Estate and best-selling international author of Australian Real Estate Investing Made Simple. Welcome to today's video. Today's video is going to be really about the market where it's heading in Melbourne and to some extent in Australia. I'm going to give you the September update on the market based on RP Data Cologic information. It's been really interesting, you know, just to give you a bit of a summary before I get into the charts and all the data. The smartest investors purchased last year, and most of them are maxed out. Um, the bottom of the market was in 22 in November, and now it's going up. But the bargains were really last year, the best time to buy was last year, even before November, because a lot of the properties that were purchased last year um, took advantage of the lower costs of construction materials. And as you know, one of the biggest problems at the moment, which is why all these builders and developers are going bust, is because the average construction cost of an average townhouse has gone up by 30 to 40 percent. Things like steel and timber fabrication and, and framing has gone up by 80 percent. So it's interesting, like in terms of the timing of the market, and I'm, I'm always a big fan of timing the market, not timing of the market, but just observing my clients, people that have 12, 15 properties and people who have two or three properties, the ones that have large portfolios already have gone into the market last year, the year before, when the market was down, depressed, they cleaned up, irrespective of all the doom and gloom in the media, and now they've made $100,000 to $200,000 in equity. The people they're getting in today are paying a premium for properties, because if you're buying off the plan or established, you're paying $100,000 more to one hundred and fifty dollars for an average, say, 18 square townhouse, um, depending on the suburb, because they vary between 14 and 18 squares. Uh, you know, 150, 60 square metres in Melbourne. So it's, so it's kind of interesting where people kind of waiting for this magical moment when the market was down. And really the best investors have just, the smartest ones have gone in even before then and cleaned up. And now they're refinancing their properties, waiting to go again. So today I'm going to cover all the market indicators you need to be aware of as a property investor. And I'm not going to dwell too much on them because we're doing macro level analysis of the market. Another video I'm going to do is micro level analysis, talking about specific suburbs and areas to invest in. But this is a really good way to kind of, you know, enlighten yourself about where the market's heading, what the market's doing, the sentiment of the market and the pulse of the market. So welcome to today's video. It's going to be quite interesting. Before we get any further, just a personal disclaimer, I'm not here to tell you that by listening to anything that I'm going to say today, you're going to make any money whatsoever. So you're going to seek professional or independent advice before you do anything. I've never met you, I don't know your risk profile or your financial standing. But if you do get professional help, make sure the people that you're speaking to have the exact results that you want to achieve. They're not just a bunch of broke academics, which is the majority of the market. A bit about myself before we go on. So I've wasted four years of my life at Monash University uh, doing assignments with international students and playing pool at the tavern and drinking lots of beer. And then I left there, got into financial planning with Australian Indy Funds Management. Um, left there, got into lending um, with NAB, eventually Medfin. And now I'm working in real estate for the last 10 years. Real estate's my passion. And I've always been passionate about real estate investing. I've got a multi-million dollar property portfolio, which is the reason that I can do these videos and teach you guys exactly what I'm doing and what other investors are doing and why we're making money and why majority of the market always gets things wrong or they arrive too late at the opportunities. And remember, opportunity cost is the biggest thing of life because you can always get more money, guys, but you can't get more time. Time is a finite resource and when it runs out, it runs out indefinitely and you cannot get it back. And unfortunately, with real estate investing, unlike the stock market or any other type of investing, the moment you hit 65, you're, you're, you're limiting yourself to how many lenders will even give you money and how much you can borrow. So you really got to build up your wealth in your working years, in your 20s, 30s and 40s, and then set yourself up for your 50s and 60s. So the earlier you start, the, the quicker you'll build up wealth and the more wealth you'll build up long term. Remember, this is not a get rich quick scheme. This is a get rich very slowly over decades scheme. <laughs> um, by the way, if you want to get a copy of my book uh, on finance, um, just jump onto bookonfinance.com.au and get a bunch of freebies, including an online course. Or you can go to any bookshop or Amazon or Booktopia. And this is my second book, which is Real Estate Made Simple, also number one bestseller multiple times. You can jump on my website and buy a copy or Amazon or any good bookshop out there. 
So basically what we're going to do, and by the way, I really want to thank you guys for supporting my book on Amazon. It's got number one bestseller multiple times. In fact, a number of times I've had my, both of my books in the top 10 in various categories, ranging from real estate investing, finance, mortgages. So I really want to thank you guys for, for buying my books and, and making it number one organically because I really spent no money on any kind of marketing. So it's literally just word of mouth and um, people buying, getting good, good experience, getting a lot of knowledge out of the books and then you know, giving me a high rating. So I really want to thank you guys for, for doing that. As a special bonus as well, because we're coming up to the end of the year, I'm going to give you a link at the end of this video where you can download my latest recording of my two-day event, which is the Real Estate Investing Fast Track Weekend. I'm running one more this year in November, and that's pretty much it. As you know, I'm pretty lazy. I don't work hard, guys. <laughs> um, I take six holidays a year. I'm taking most of December and January off. Um, we're going to Hamilton Island and a couple of other islands. So it's going to be amazing. Um, and so I won't be available for consultations or live events um, just because that's what I want. I, you know, I'm doing this for lifestyle. So for those of you who are interested and you can't make it physically to Melbourne, this is your number one resource to watch. It's 15 hours, it's two days of content, and it really will take you to the next level of knowledge and investing, and especially with structuring and finance, which is a topic that a lot of people are not familiar with, this can really take your knowledge base to the, to the high level. So I encourage you to stick to the end of this video and then get the link and then upload this, this um, online video course for free. There's no strings attached, there's no upsell, there's nothing. You just literally can access it right after this video and watch it and get educated. And you, you look, you'll know more than 99% of investors out there. Okay, so let's get into it. So now, just before we get into data, okay, there's a saying in mathematics, there are lies, there are damn lies, and there are statistics, okay? And the problem is, the data that I'm showing you is old, okay? Even though we're doing September, and September has just completed, as you know, we're in October now, the best data that we capture with the market is about six to 12 months old, because a lot of properties are sold with 90 days settlements, which is three months. So how can you capture that data from September if, we've, if we've, it's only early October right now? Like that, those sales won't be captured until January next year, realistically speaking. A lot of agents don't report all the sales, just so you know, especially with properties that were passed in at auction and then sold after the auction was passed in or the following weeks. So really, what, just so you understand, from a very practical perspective, this, these stats don't encapsulate the entire market. There's a lot of property sales that go through undetected, um, through mainstream real estate agencies, as well as specialised agencies like myself, where I'm sourcing properties every day. And I've sold a lot of properties last month and the month before, but no one knows about them. I haven't, I haven't reported that information anywhere. And th that information is definitely missing from the stats we're going to see today. So, so what I'm saying is really the best data, the most accurate data is around 12 months old, where it pretty much captures everything from the State Revenue Office and all the other various government bodies. The worst data is a week old, you know, but it's all we've got to go by. You know, we've got to have some kind of a sense of what the market's doing. We've got to know what the pulse is doing of the market, but it's really not something that I really pay attention to anymore. When I started investing 20 years ago, this is all I was paying attention to. Median price movements, vendor discounting, where we are in the property cycle. Now it's not important because I do fundamental analysis. So this is technical analysis. And just so you understand, in real estate investing, anyone that does technical analysis dies broke completely. Just like a black box system. Black box systems don't work. They don't work in the stock market. They don't work in real estate as, as, at all, okay? So when people say, and I see these research companies out there popping up everywhere with their special algorithms and black box systems, and they say, Melbourne is not doing, is it a good time to get into Melbourne? What, what is Melbourne doing? And they go, it's, not, it's too early to get into Melbourne. Guys, what's Melbourne? Melbourne is Turak, 15 million, and St. Albans, 600,000. There's no such thing as Melbourne. Melbourne has eight different markets inside, and they're all doing completely different things. So when people start talking about Melbourne as a common market, run away, okay? Number two, black box systems don't work. They fail all the time. If black box systems work, then BlackRock funds management would put a billion dollars into them, okay? So whenever you see anything, and I've been trading shares now for 20 years, and I trade options, active trading, and passive trading blue chip. 
Just so you understand, every black box systems I've come across has always failed and people lost a large amounts of money. Because people who think ultimately they can just sit on the couch somewhere with a ball of Maltesers and press a freaking button and become wealthy, okay? It's bullshit, okay? You've got to do a lot of research and a lot of, a lot of investing in your, per, in your personal development and time to get wealthy. There is no system where you can sit on your ass on the couch on your Maltesers watching Netflix and just press a button and become wealthy. If, if, that, if someone is giving you that system, it's a scam, okay? <laughs> just so you understand. So over the last 25 years, I've come across hundreds of black box systems that predict behavior of a market based on algorithms or patterns, and they have all failed long term. People have lost everything using them, okay? And this is why Warren Buffett doesn't use black boxes. Think about this for a second, right? If you've got all these billionaires with lots of money like Warren Buffett, who just liquidated virtually his whole portfolio, do you think he's not aware there's a black box system out there somewhere? Why wouldn't Warren Buffett just put a billion dollars into one of them? Why don't they ever touch these black box systems? Why don't the top 100 most successful traders in the world never ever touch a black box? Think about it logically. But you see them selling these black box solutions everywhere, on TikTok, on, every, on Instagram, on Facebook, and you're special, you're the only one that found out, right? Warren Buffett doesn't know about it, okay? BlackRock Funds Management don't know about it, okay? Um, all the fund managers, but you found it because this guy in New Zealand has a solution that's going to make you wealthy. <laughs> it's, just, it's insanity, right? It's just crazy. The, most of those people actually deserve to lose money because of how, the stupidity, you know? So it, just so you know, if, if a Nigerian prince has emailed you that he wants to get a billion dollars out of the country and he needs your bank account details, if you're dumb enough to fall for that, you kind of deserve to lose that money. You know, there's a saying, a fool and his money will soon be parted. And this is very true. So the reason a Nigerian king trying to get out of Nigeria to give you a billion dollars, but you were selected randomly, but it's a secret. Okay, just why? <laughs> How does that work? <laughs> now, macro level. The Australian property market is worth $10 trillion. The gearing is $2.2 trillion, which is outstanding mortgages which is 22%. Just think about it for a second and forget about everything else about the market. 10 trillion in value, 22 trillion in mortgages, 22% gearing or 22 LVR. So imagine you have a million dollar house and you've got a $220,000 mortgage and you're making a lot of money in your job. Are you stressed? Is there any risk of this market imploding or collapsing or bloodbath on the streets. No, nothing. Nothing is going to happen to the Australian property market, guys. We have an extremely low debt to value ratio of 22%. So when these people come out with all these arguments about it's unsustainable, it's unaffordable, boo hoo. And it's always on channel two, right? It's always on, on all the left wing media, how all the kids can't get into the market and blah, blah, blah. You know, boo hoo. It's always been unaffordable, right? The reality is you can't have it both ways. You can't have a high performing market that's affordable. What does that mean? It's either high performing and unaffordable or low performing and affordable. It's like saying it's an it's a expensive high performing car or you can't have a cheap high performing car. It's either expensive high performing or cheap and low performing. It, it's an oxymoron. It doesn't work both ways. But if anyone says from America, because you get these experts flying in with their books saying, I'm going to get in the head, you guys are going to lose all your money, sell your house and buy gold. 22% guys is the gearing. $10 trillion. The Australian superannuation pool is only $3.5 trillion. The Australian stock exchange by capitalisation is $2.9 trillion. The housing market is three times larger than the ASX combined, okay, which is all the companies in Australia basically. And then we have commercial real estate, which is really good, 1.3 trillion. Commercial is very different because the value of commercial property is purely based on the lease, where with residential property, the lease is irrelevant. They don't even, you don't even need a lease to value the property, where valuations for commercial property is purely based on the lease. And obviously it's very volatile. I mean, look what's happening at the moment in Melbourne with retail. I mean, how many businesses have gone under because of dictator Dan? By the way, he's gone, fantastic. We had a, we had a barbecue celebration on the weekend. Um, celebrating the fact that he's gone, um, leaving the whole you know, Victoria in a mess. Great time to exit, you know, the same like a sinking ship and the rats just disappear, you know, which is fantastic. Um, but anyway, 
time will tell. It doesn't affect anything that I'm doing or my clients because you know we've got buffers and we, we've got investment properties, but it, it is what it is. Commercial is very interesting. It's very specialised and you've got to really know what you're doing. Just from a high level perspective, retail's dead as disco. What's really good at the moment is self storage facilities and medical clinics and childcare facilities. If you're looking for shop front, unless you're going to put townhouses or apartments on top, you know, I wouldn't buy any retail space at the moment. Office space is dead as well. It's slowly coming back. I mean, we had a, a low probably about a year and a half ago in Melbourne where you couldn't lease anything out. There was just no demand. Now businesses are getting their employees back into the office because the culture is, is, is changing in some companies and they need to reinstate the culture of a company, which is really important. So people kind of negotiating how many days they're doing from home, how many are doing from, from the office. And a lot of my clients now, the predominantly working from home during COVID are doing two or three days in the office, usually like a Tuesday to a Thursday, and then Monday and Friday, and obviously the weekend they have off, they're working from home. But I can just say that, like in terms of our country's wealth, 56.3% of our wealth is held in residential property, which is $10 trillion. So the banks, valuers, financial institutions are going to do everything they can to make sure this thing doesn't fail. We can't allow it to fail, guys. It's too big. And if there's an inkling that it's in trouble in any way, from any direction, that section will be propped up completely, instantly, pretty much. There'll be money thrown at it, whatever the problem is. So you've got to understand that if you get, ever get talked out of investing in the real estate market, and by the way, I'm not saying that any property is going to make you money because people lose money because they buy shipping properties in areas that don't grow. But as a concept, if anyone's telling you the market's going to fail en masse, I mean, they've got to go back and get re-educated. It's just not going to happen fundamentally. It doesn't have the, the fundamentals to collapse. It's too big to fail, guys. The Australian dwelling values, this is like an overview of what's happening nationally if you merge all the markets together. So national value homes rose 2.5% in three months to August, down slightly from 2.9 growth in, the, in over the three months to July. So we're, we're in positive territory. As a whole nation, we're going up again, obviously, which is fantastic. Now, by the way, 2.5% over a quarter is nearly like 10% over the year. So it's, it's really, we've, we've come back from the low of the COVID market that we've had. In the last 12 months, um, values are down 1.1% annually, and the annual growth is likely to flatten towards the, th the end of the year because the market's really, you know, December, the market shuts down. Um, negative 1.14 was the smallest annual decline since October 22. Now remember, it's 1.1 because we're combining all the markets together and then some are in different parts of the property cycle, which I'll explain later on why there's a distinction between these, these two numbers, okay? Um, so in terms of the, the property market's very cyclical in its nature, as you can see, it goes up and down, and these are combined capitals and combined regionals. Regionals and combined capitals are very similar to each other. The only distinction is the capitals tend to go up much higher and have lower lows. We can see the regionals don't have the same volatility. They, they tend to have a smaller range of movement because the prices are lower in regional towns. So for example, what that means is, if you look at Bendigo, for example, you know, a, a mansion in Bendigo will be between three and five million. A mansion in Melbourne will be between 10 and 50 million. So obviously the volatility, the range of prices is much greater than, than in Bendigo. That's why the, the Bendigo mansion market might go up slower or have less volatility than the Melbourne um, mansion market, which, which by the way, they, I'm talking about the mansion market because those markets are the first indicator. We're going to the next phase of the next property cycle. So we have Australia growing at 2.5. This is changing dwellings three months to August 23, uh, which is the latest data. This is from September. Combined regional 0.8 and then combined capitals 3.1. So capitals obviously have more jobs, more pressure on land more population, more competition, therefore it, it, they always go a little bit higher than um, everything combined together. Melbourne 1.6, Brisbane 4.2, Sydney 3.8. So it's well and truly, the market has come back, there's no question about it. In terms of 12 months, you can see there the bottom was here back in 22, November, which I called by the way on my YouTube channel exactly the month that it happened. 
before we, before we had the data, I could just feel it. And then when the data came back in, in February, everyone said, oh yeah, it was back then in November. Well, yeah, I know, but okay. We know that now. <laughs> it's like saying, oh, you know, it's important to get Powerball numbers on Thursday. On Friday, it's not that important anymore because <laughs> you can't use them, <laughs> okay? So yeah, it's easy to say when um, Monday experts so that was the bottom of the market. Was it important to get in the market in November last year? Like, was it something crucial happening in November where there were special deals in the market? No, there wasn't. In fact, I would say, like I said on my video, in November last year, looking at the top end of the market, I'm talking about Port Melbourne, Hawthorne, Turak, Brighton, there was nothing really exciting on the market, to be honest with you. Because most of these properties that are the top high-end properties, which are either trophy homes or high-grade investment properties, those people have no mortgages or they have such great buffers, they choose when to sell. So no one was really selling the best properties in November. So the problem with timing the market is you might time the market perfectly. Let's say you listen to me for the next 10 years and I'll tell you when the next dip will be and you get there. But what happens when you get there and you can't borrow as much money as you could 12 months beforehand because, hey, we had 12 increases in rates or there's just nothing really good to buy. Like, wouldn't you feel like an idiot if you got there after waiting for 10 years to get this, to this mythical, magical moment when the market's at the lowest point, right? There it is there. And it's like, well, there's nothing here to buy. So you've just wasted 10 years waiting for this moment. You've got nothing to show for it. That's why it's not timing of the market, it's time in the market. And you need to buy as much as you can as often as you can, okay? Forget about this timing of the market stuff. People that do that are gamblers. And even if you get it right a couple of times every decade, it doesn't make any difference at all compared to consistent buying the right stock at the right price at the right time. I would rather overpay, and I'm borrowing words here from Warren Buffett, for a fantastic property than underpay for a bad property. Because long term, even though you've got negative equity short term, over 10 years, it doesn't make any difference. Right? If you, if you bought a... If you, if you bought a property for 550 10 years ago and, and it was worth 500, so you paid 10% above market, right? You paid 550, you got ripped off, or you just didn't know how to read the market properly. If it's worth 1.5 today, do you really care that you have negative equity for eight months or, or seven months? Does it really make any difference? It doesn't make any difference at all. But what you don't want to happen is buy a $500,000 property for 450 and today it's 600,000 which is what happened with two bedroom apartments in Melbourne, in Docklands and South Bank. People who have made no money and all sold at a loss. So once again, I'm happy to overpay for a really good property, then underpay for a bad one. Because long term, you're gonna get penalized by the market. It's how well you read the market and how well you understand the fundamental growth drivers and how well you do your property selection that will determine your success. <coughs> so Australia, this is for 12 months, three months to August, so once again, negative 1.1 from the peak, 4% negative from the peak, and then combined capitals, 0.1. Because remember, this was the bottom of the market, so we're going up, and we just keep going up, but this was the peak of the market. And I'll show you the next video where I think we'll be and when the peak of the market will happen. So we can see that a lot of the capitals here, like Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Adelaide, are very similar in terms of their cyclical nature, except the only difference is that Adelaide, um, and Brisbane have a lower median price, therefore the, the lows and highs are a little bit smaller compared to Melbourne and Sydney, which have much more expensive properties on the market. Perth, Hobart, Darwin, ACT are completely different. They're counter-cyclical to these areas here. Now, be careful with these companies that say they follow the market cycles and they have this kind of and I see them all the time, it's such a scam. And they go, oh, well, Melbourne's going down, um, and at the same time, you know, uh, Hobart's going up, so let's jump onto Hobart. Yeah, but what is Hobart? What is Melbourne? What they ultimately do is they tell you that Melbourne's going down, Hobart's going up, and they sell you a house and land package in Hobart that no one's to live in. Okay? So, so Melbourne, what's Melbourne? Melbourne is St. Albans and Turak. It's Brighton and Frankston North. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's just... There's, there's such a disparity between these suburbs. So be careful with these expert so-called research companies that say, oh, we're always chasing the next cycle, yeah, and they end up selling house and land. House and land is not Australia, guys. 
Okay? Blue chip areas that are 100 years old is what makes up these markets. Sydney and Melbourne, the market is not driven by Pakenham and Berwick, okay? or, or Point Cook, or Trigon and Tamit, or South Morang. Okay? So we're driven, or Melton, for example, we're driven by Fitzroy, Collingwood, Carlton, these areas. Okay? So forget about these, these research companies always do the same thing. Melbourne's going down, so let's now go to areas that are going up. Oh, ACT, Darwin, Hobart, Perth are going up. Here's a bunch of house and land packages. Come on, seriously? Be careful with those guys. Now, this is a really good indicator because in the property market, in every state, every capital city, you have percentiles, so you, so you can't capture all the properties together because obviously there are properties in Melbourne that are 500,000, a million, two million, 10 million. So we have the percentiles. We can, we can kind of divide the market into percentiles. You've got the cheapest 25%, the mid-range, and then the highest 75th percentile. Now, these are all the mansions, which are the dark blue bars. And every property cycle starts with the top end going first. Then the middle end picks up, and then the bottom gets dragged up, okay? And that's, that happens every property cycle, where you can do your research, since we've really started collecting data since the Second World War. So what we're seeing now is, in Sydney, which is the biggest market, and the most important market by capitalisation, you can see the high end has gone up by 4%, and this is quarterly change um, in the index, three months to August. Mid has gone up by 3.8, and the lowest has gone by 2.8. And eventually, when the, when the cycle's at its peak and about to go down, the lowest properties will be high, this will be in the middle, and these will be at the bottom. Because that's when it's correcting, because the rich people choose when they sell because they've got no mortgage pressure. They don't need to sell unless they're getting the right price. So what you can see is Sydney, the top end is taken off, Melbourne the same, 1.8, and Brisbane as well, 4.4. I'd like, no one cares. No one cares about it. Um, so you can see that the biggest markets have taken off, and then the, the second one is obviously the mid-range properties, and this is the cheapest properties. So that's, what, that's a really good indicator from a macro level, big picture economic kind of indicators that we're going into the next growth of the property cycle. Housing cycles, is it important to be aware of this? I think so, long term, in terms of if you're like hedging interest rates and you want to lot fix rates, and you want to know how, where the market is and how, you know, how much movement there'll be, is it going to come down, is it going to go up, especially with rental yields which are linked to property cycles. So you can see there, for example, this is the 28-day growth rate in uh, the CoreLogic Daily Value Index. This is like the pulse of the market. It kind of tells you where the market is, not from an investment perspective or anything, it's like the health of the market, the pulse of the market. It gives you kind of an indicator of, okay, we're kind of here, this was the bottom of here, and then we're going sideways, which is true because at the end of the year, the market kind of shuts down. This gives you more information because there's, you can't put all the major capital cities and regional towns together into one big pot and mix them all up. I mean, you're not going to get a really true indicator. So I always, as the bare minimum, I look at Melbourne, Sydney, and Brisbane separately. Okay? They're all synchronised. They're all part of the big, big picture, and it's 75% of the whole market value. So who cares about the other 25%, you know? Now, I'm not saying, by the way, the other 25% is not important in terms of you, you don't need to invest in it. You can, in get, in, you can make a killing, guys, in regional towns. I know people that live in a town of 20,000 people, and they make a killing because they know everything about the town. They know the town planning, they know the future housing strategy report. So you don't need to play in the biggest market to make money. What I'm saying is, for the purpose of today and researching, this is kind of how I look at the market as a bare minimum. So you look at Sydney, for example, and we can see there, in terms of just, I, I like graphs more than numbers because I like to see at an instant what happened in the past. You can see there, that was the peak, right? That was the bottom. We're truly well going up now. And this is the change in the market in terms of volume. So, so that's an indicator, yeah, the market has, is back. Same in Melbourne. Peak, bottom, going up. You know, same in Brisbane. Peak, bottom, going up. Okay? Does that mean that it's going to change anything to do with how I buy properties? It doesn't really impact anything. The only thing my impact is, I think the peak, and I'll show you in the next video, will be around 26, 27. And therefore, you know, maybe fixing rates will be an option. 
at the moment, I just leave everything variable. You know, I think there's going to be rate cuts on the books next year. Adelaide, who cares? Perth, okay, peak. Same thing with Hobart, peak, bottom, going up. Darwin, down, sideways. Canberra. Okay, sales and listings. Now, this is kind of gives you an idea of the volume of stock that's on the market, which is kind of important because sales and listings gives you more about not so much the pulse of the market, but the sentiment of vendors and how the market is meeting the vendor's expectations. Because see, vendors are always unrealistic about properties. They always think the house is special, it should be 100,000 more than any other house in the street. But that's, that's, that's fine, no one, no, one, no one holds it against them, but the market is the reality of the market. The market is what the market is. It's a meeting ground between two parties. You know, one's with this price, one's with, and obviously the buyers always want to pay the least amount of money, and there's a meeting ground in the middle. And that tells you that meeting round, which is vendor discounting days on the market, tells you really what the market is doing at the moment compared to last year. So sales data and listings and volume of listings, days on the market, tells you about where we were last year at the same time, where we are today, and what's the main difference between the last 12 months. And that's the biggest thing about this. So call logic estimates, there were 38,149 sales in August nationally compared to a historic five-year average of 39,774 for the month of August. Six-month moving trend suggests the sales volume was stabilising despite being down from the heights in 2021. So you can see there, in terms of volume of listings, Australia is negative 17.1% compared to the norm. Why is it negative? Number of reasons. Number one, a lot of developers and builders have gone bust. Number two, 12 increases in rates have diminished people's borrowing capacity, so people are forced to rent, they can't buy what they want. Um, and also, in terms of holding, a lot of people are holding properties longer and longer. In Melbourne, Vermont South, the average property is held now for 23.3 years. So the suburbs where people are not selling at all, there's critical shortage of stock, there's a lot of developers who have exited as well, and therefore, um, you know, it's one of these things that's reflected in a lower combined um, volume of sales. Combined regionals, 20% negative as well, so literally um, one-fifth. And nationals, combined capital, 15.4%. You can see here, this is a five-year average line, and so when we're above the line, it means there's a surplus of listings from the norm. Now remember, what is the average of the norm? In a country where population keeps growing, I'm not sure how good that indicator is because effectively we're importing 650,000 migrants. So the norm is going to change dramatically in the next 12 months and 24 months compared to what it was two years ago when the whole country was shut down. But anyway, it is what it is. We can see that we had a massive excess of properties um, compared to what we needed. And at the bottom, bottom now, there's a, there's a declining volume of stock on the market, which means that we're putting more pressure on prices. Because when you have a reduction in the volume, which is, you know, if you look at the Australia 17%, 15.4, I mean, that's out of 100 properties, now there's 85 instead of 100. There's more competition for the remaining stock, more pressure on property prices to go up. This is also important, which is the median days on the market, which I really like as an indicator because it tells me how quickly properties sell. Because remember, agents want to sell the property before the auction, preferably. No one wants to go to auction, okay? It's expensive, it, it takes up your weekends. Um, if you can sell it and get a good price before an auction, most agents will, will do that because strategically and, and from an effort perspective. Because remember, at the end of the day, they just want to get the commission. They don't care about auctions, non-auctions. If they can get the price and they can get their 2% plus GST, the transaction's done. So you can see there, the amount of time it takes to sell property trends slightly higher throughout the three months to August, with the million days market reaching 32 days. So 32 days to sell an average house. This was up from a recent low of 30 days in the three months to April. The million days on the market has continued to rise across the combined regional markets to 45 days in the three months to August. So in Australia, okay, it's 32 days now to sell a house compared to the same time last year, which was 30 days but it's Australia all combined together. 
if you look at combined regionals, 45 days to 33, which means regional centres are going down in value and less stock is being sold. So the, the, the whole shine of, you know, sea change and tree change, that's all finished now. Everyone's coming back to Melbourne. Well, the ones that want to come back to Melbourne or the major capital cities. So I know a lot of people that moved into regional towns and then they get there at six o'clock and everything's shut down. They go, where are the clubs and the bars? Oh no, <laughs> we don't have those here. They're back in Melbourne and Sydney. Oh, so what do you do here after six o'clock? Oh, we got to sleep at seven o'clock. Okay, okay. Honey, pack your suitcase, back to Melbourne. And that's what's happening to a lot of people that moved that made the sea change and tree change during COVID. Back to the bars, back to nightlife. <laughs> So Melbourne, which is, and these are combined capital cities, 27 days now compared to 29 days last year. So the capital cities are taking off where regional towns are slowing down. And you can see that Melbourne, for example, 29 days, August 23, which is today, well, was, well, was data, the latest data we have looking back, 30 days last year. So it takes one day less to sell a house in Melbourne compared to the same time last year, which also reinforces the fact we're moving into the next phase of the property cycle. Sydney's the same thing, 29 days and 36 days last year, now 29 days. Brisbane, 23 and 23, so it's always stagnating behind. It's always Sydney, Melbourne, and then Brisbane in terms of the cycle. And then we have Adelaide, who cares? And then we have Perth, 14 and 20. So now it's, it's, it's literally six days quicker to sell a property. And look, Perth is a smaller market compared to the major capital cities, less builders, less volume. So it's not, it's not a true indicator that, that um, you know, the Perth has taken off. Uh, but it's, it is an indicator in terms of people's appetite to buy properties, nonetheless. Vendor discounting is also very good because it gives you the idea of, of the market meeting the unrealistic expectations of vendors with the bargain kind of ideology of, of buyers and, and there's a meeting place in the middle which tells you the, the reality of the situation. So at the median level, vendors are now offering less of a discount on their property. The median vendor discount nationally was zero, was negative 3.8 in the three months to August, up from recent 4.3 in last year. So last year, the average vendor would discount, say for every 100,000, 4,300 to sell the house and now it's down to 3,800. So discounts are getting lower and lower. In Melbourne, for example, so Australia is 3.8 versus 4.1. Combined cities, see now regionals are discounting higher this year compared to last year. 4.3 versus 4.1 last year. And then combined capitals, as it, because they're going into the next growth phase, 3.4 versus 4.2. So once again, more evidence, we're going to the next growth phase of the cycle. And you can see there, Sydney, for example, 3.2% now, which is where it was 5.1 last year, so much more, less discount. Melbourne, 3.7 versus 4. And then um, Brisbane is 3.1 versus 4.3. So all the major markets, there's less discounts available by vendors to move the same volume of properties. And remember, the volume is lower as well. So there's more pressure on prices and there's lower discounts. And this is depicted graphically in terms of the gap between combined regionals, combined capitals, and in terms of discounting variance. This doesn't really tell you much because listings really, in the market only operates 10 months of the year. Like no one wants to do anything in December and November, and even January, people are in holiday mode. You know, we're, we're kind of like a nation of sporting fanatics and holiday people. The moment you mention December, everyone's already in la la land. Christmas shopping, barbecues. People don't want to commit to properties, you know. Um, I remember the investment market is a very small part of the market. Most of the market, 70% is driven by owner occupiers, people living in houses. So the moment the market gets to that point here, it pretty much shuts down. It's only, this is the market really, you know. So, so this, this kind of decline at the, at the, in January, it goes up and then it gets declines. That's just the normality of the market. It doesn't really tell you much. No good agent would ever advertise a property on the 20th of December because most people are away and they wouldn't turn up to an auction or an open. So this doesn't really tell you much about the market. It's very misleading. I don't pay attention to listings, um, apart from the volume of listings, um, which is down. Um, 
So compared to the same time last year, negative 11% and then 23.4. So there's a lower volume of listings, previous five year average, and we're here in 22 and 23. That's a good indicator because you can see we've dropped in terms of volume. But in terms of the actual curvature of the line, it's, it's not really representative of any kind of behavior that you can use to ascertain anything about the market. Um, once again, yeah, so listings, you know, I wouldn't pay too much attention to it. And see, listings also vary from suburb to suburb. You have, like, the best suburbs in Melbourne, which are, let's say, Elwood, St Kilda, Port Melbourne, Essendon, they're very old suburbs. They're 100 years old. There's no new stock in those suburbs. And sometimes you have developers settling in those suburbs that are apartments, and they kind of misrepresent the volume in that suburb as well. So you've got to be careful with, with the volume of listings because it's not only specific per suburb, it's what kind of a property is being listed. Because you can have 100 apartments suddenly available as a one-off and it suddenly it looks like it's a surplus. And this is the problem with these research companies. It's, so, it's, it's hilarious. I wish I could name names, I just don't want to get sued, right? Because they're quite large. Uh, and I'm just me in my company and with support stuff. But it, the hilarious thing is, I know they've never been to these suburbs. Like they're sitting in Sydney somewhere or Brisbane with these research tools. They're a bunch of academics, right? And they, and they go, oh, this area. And I'm thinking, have you ever been to that suburb? The, the suburbs are shit. You know, like no one's to live there. It's, an, <laughs> it's a disaster zone. I know they're just looking at volume. And the other thing they look for is DSR, which is demand to, to ratio, um, uh, demand to supply ratios, which is very misleading because you might have parts of, for example, Sunshine. I like Sunshine, I'm a big fan, right? It's going through gentrification. But Sunshine has new estates in it, and sometimes the new estate releases 100 new homes. So sometimes the volume of homes, of new homes, because new homes and old homes are grouped together, misrepresents what's happening in the suburb. Because people that are looking to live in Sunshine, it's a different market for new homes and a different market for established homes, right? Very rarely do people look for both. Okay, it's either they look for one or the other. So you might have 16 old homes, 100 new homes, but the buyers that are wanting the big blocks of 700, 200 square meters, they don't want the old new house on 200, 300 square meters. So they're looking for the other markets. It's almost like you've got two markets in one, but these research companies don't differentiate between it. They capture the whole data together. And that's why it's always misleading. It's always doesn't make sense and it's contradictory in a lot, a lot of times. This is the actual auction clearing rates as well. So it, it is, it's a good indicator of where we are in terms of um, where the market is heading as a, as a pulse, another dimension to measuring the pulse of the market. Combined cities, auction clearing rates was fairly steady throughout the month, averaging 66.1 in the four weeks ending September 20, um, 323 compared to an average of 65 in the four weeks to end. So you can see there it's higher, right? And you just got to break it down into individual uh, major capital cities. Like Melbourne at the moment is around 70%. So seven out of 10 homes are getting sold, three are getting passed in. That's a pretty decent market, you know. The highest that I've seen was 98, which is during the 2001 boom. And the lowest was about 46 during the GFC. And that was ridiculous, you know, five out of 10 houses were getting passed in. Rental market is going ballistically well. I mean, it is phenomenal. The rates that I'm getting for my properties are ridiculous. And they've completely surpassed any increase in interest rates. Um, and especially the suburbs that I've chosen my properties in, which are, which are blue chip properties. And not only myself, my clients that are buying properties in places like Elwood, Brighton East, they're laughing all the way to the bank because the rents have gone through the roof. And I'm talking about 20%, 30% increases in 12 months. Not three or four percent, guys, 20 to 30 percent. It's ridiculous increases in, in rentals. But you can only do it in suburbs where people have high disposable income. You can't increase rentals by 30 percent in Melton South. They're going to move out of the property. They can't afford that increase, okay? But if you do it in Richmond or Brighton East or Essendon in a townhouse, they'll absorb it. So the increases have been phenomenally high. And look, if they're in line with the market, the market is what the market is. I mean, no one's going to legislate about whether the market is too high or too low. It's too, it's too cumbersome to do that. You have to set up an independent body in every major capital city to oversee that. It's never going to happen. Rentals have gone, and this is just, the numbers are just staggering. I mean, normally rentals just keep up with inflation, which is 5.2 now, which just went up from 4.9 to 5.2. 
Nationally, rentals are up 9% across all Australian properties, including regional areas. Regional is 4.2, by the way, because they're cheaper, but in terms of combined capitals, 10.9, nearly 11%. So that means if you're getting $500 a week rental, you're getting 555. If you're getting a thousand rental, you're getting 1100. I mean, in one year, that's a huge jump. And this is the combined capitals, guys. Remember, I'm only choosing, I'm cherry picking the best suburbs. You know, that's why we're getting double digit growth. Look at the increase. I mean, it's, it's huge. So the landlords that bought here have capitalized a massive increase in rentals. So remember, when you're buying here now, right, you can't get this growth which happened there. And that's why, and no one could see this coming. There was no data that told anyone, oh, by the way, we're going to have 10% increase in rentals next year. Okay? That data doesn't exist. It just happened and it took everyone by surprise. And it was either you had properties at the time or you didn't have properties. That's why it's so important just to keep buying whenever you can buy. Okay? Rather this timing of the market bullshit. It's like, when do you build a body in, 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 in you build it in the winter when it's pissing rain, down raining and it's cold. You don't build a body six weeks before summer. That's when you get shredded and you show all the good work that you've built up over the winter. I mean, I, I, I train at a hardcore powerlifting gym in Melbourne. I train from home most of the time, but I go to this powerlifting just to catch up with my mates now and then. And I see all the people now that have joined in the last two weeks. And we just go, yeah, they'll be gone in two weeks. They'll be gone in a month, you know? And during the winter months, where it's cold outside, raining, all the professionals are there training their asses off. Same with the property, guys. You build your portfolios during the normal period of the market. No one is up or down. If anything, it's the opposite of what everyone's doing, which is you buy at the bottom and you revalue at the top to increase your lines of credit. But rentals have been amazing. Now, the media doesn't focus on stories of John and Jenny who bought an investment property now have made where it was cash flow neutral two years ago. Now they're making a thousand bucks a month and they're laughing, are they? All they're showing is the people that can't get into the rental market. See, the media is always negative. Whatever's happening, they show the worst part of that to sell newspapers and the story because it's all doom and gloom always with the media. <laughs> There's never ever a story about people making money and being comfortable. Can you imagine the story like that just once? This is John and Jenny, their average income earners. John is a police officer, Jenny works at Woolies. Um, because they're smart, they got educated, they bought three investment properties, and now they're all cash flow positive, and they've paid off their house. John, how do you feel? Great. Jenny, do you feel good? Yeah, fantastic. We've got no stress, no pressure. We've actually increased our holidays per year. Great. Over to you, John. Can you imagine that's a story? I mean, when would that ever happen? <laughs> it's never going to happen, right? It's about John and Jenny losing their house or getting robbed by a bunch of machete will you know um criminals it's always doom and gloom <laughs> it's always doom and gloom because bad news sells guys and people get conditioned they think i'm going to get attacked by a guy with a machete you know you get a better chance of winning a lotto than getting attacked so dwelling approvals as well the, look dwelling approvals are very complex i could do a whole um youtube um video just on this because we're talking about interest rates we're talking about sentiment we're talking about Builders and developers going bust. We're talking about legislation around land releases. So it's a complex thing. It's not even a pulse. It's so complex and there's so many moving parts. I don't even worry about it most of the time because most of the dwelling approvals, if you take out house and land and high density apartments, the rest is virtually never changes. You know, like if you look at St Kilda, for example, where my office is, and I'm here right now in the boardroom. The amount of houses you get every week is 10 to 12, 15. It doesn't make a difference if there's a tower approved for 100 apartments somewhere in St Kilda East or St Kilda. It doesn't change anything about the other properties. So what dwelling approvals, they don't impact the entire market. They're very specific to one part of the market and really has no variance or bearing on what I do because I'm, I don't invest in that part of the market. I don't buy house and land. I don't buy high density apartments. They're not a good investment vehicle. So I don't really pay attention to dwellings. Finance and lending is also very complex. I'm not going to cover it today because I, it has so many parts to it. You know, I need to unpack it in more detail. And it's beyond just saying it's up and down and this is what they're doing last year. There's too many variables, too many moving parts. I can do a whole video just on finance as well, which I will do. So I'm going to skip these sections. Uh, probably the best news is... We had a new, obviously, RBA um, did an increased rate, so our bank swap rate is 4.1%.
which means our rates have become consistent, remain the same. I think personally now with inflation going up from 4.9 to 5.2, there's going to be pressure on the RBA to do a small increase maybe next year. I don't think they'll do it this year because we want to make sure that Christmas sales are very strong because we need that injection, we need that boost of adrenaline into the economy um, and people need to become more positive. So I don't think strategically they'll do another increase this year. I think they'll do one early next year and then eventually they'll be uh, and I think if inflation is under control, they'll start cutting rates very slowly. But time will tell. I've been wrong in the past. I'm only human. Um, so, you know, it is what it is. But I mean, it is very high compared to the norm. It's still lower than the average, which is 7.25, which is the average interest rate in the last 50 years. So we're still below the average. Most of my clients are getting loans for 6.2, 6.3, you know, um, which is 1% below what I used to do when I was working for NAB and Medfin. So it's still a very good place to be in right now, but it is challenging nonetheless. In the news, a couple of things I want to cover. House prices are going up, and I'm going to do another video just showing you what's happening in Melbourne. Despite, it's funny because Westpac's one of the worst forecasters in Australia. They're so funny. I don't even understand how these people can keep their jobs. It's just embarrassing how wrong they get things. They go from negative 10, negative 20 to suddenly positive 10 in one month. And what happened last month? <laughs> what changed? <laughs> um, so it's hilarious. Like in August 23, Westpac forecast 7% rise in house prices for 23. And then in August 11th, it was 8%. And then before it was negative 15. And it's just, they're always correcting themselves, um, which, is, which is really interesting. So one of the biggest challenges that we're facing currently as a nation is there's about 770,000 Australians that are coming out of fixed rates, mainly three of fixed rates, going to variable rates. So they're coming out of 2.8, 2.7, going to 6, 6.5, 7%. And in fact, so in the last few months, especially in July, August, September, there's been literally the bulk of that coming out and going into that particular phase. And it's hurting a lot of people. A lot of people are doing it tough because their mortgages have virtually doubled, uh, especially if they took out interest-only loans. So I know people that were paying $4,000 per month for their home, they're, they're paying $8,000 for their home, plus fuel costs, you know, uh, cost of food, everything's gone up because obviously inflation is tracking very high. So this is one of the things you've got to be aware of as an investor because those mortgage stress clients and people are focused in specific areas around Melbourne, mainly in the house and land packages on the fringes of Melbourne. There's very few of those people inside the suburbs that I'm sourcing. It's just, they, they're just not there because affordability is not an issue there. Most people will have very high incomes and very high disposable income in those suburbs. So you just gotta be careful with reading the economy. And this is why it's so important to understand what's happening economically, not just purely from an academic perspective, but from a money-making perspective. We've gotta be aware of what is the impact of these things onto my ability to make money. So mortgage stress, 1.43 million Australians are at risk. Now eventually they will turn into probably half a million because the media always gets things wrong. And look, the reality is that our culture is such that we will sacrifice holidays, cars, clothing, but not the house. So people, and also people have saved a lot of money during COVID-19 because, because we didn't go for holidays, we couldn't travel. So there were massive buffers that people have built up and they're, they're spending those buffers now to maintain their home. The home is the last thing that people will let go of. They'll sacrifice everything but the home, which is, which is what we've been conditioned to do as, as a nation. So I think the fallout will be a lot lower than what the media is trying to get us to believe. And time will tell, but so far there is no tsunami of insolvencies and bankruptcies like the predictions uh, we, we had, you know, six to 12 months ago, none of that eventuated. Yes, there are mortgage stress suburbs, and I've done um, YouTube videos showing you heat maps of suburbs where, you know, seven or, or out of 10 homes are 90 days in arrears with their mortgage, so they've missed three repayments. But like I mentioned in those videos, it's too big to fail, and in fact, the banks won't allow those mortgages to fail and, be, and those houses to be repossessed. They'll just keep rolling them over and extending the mortgages, extending the terms of payment, deferring interest repayments. It's in no one's interest, number one, to let those houses fall. Number two, the banks are not logistically set up to repossess one million homes. They just, they just haven't got the resources to do that. So 
And we've seen that during the GFC in America, where at the peak of the GFC, it was something like a million homes per week were becoming uh, repossessed by the banks. And they were zombie loans because they just couldn't physically have enough staff to process those delinquent loans, which is a very similar situation in Australia. So I think all this stuff with this mortgage stress bubble that was supposed to happen, yes, people are stressed, but they're going to cope well and they're going to get through it. And I think it's going to have any impact in Melbourne and Sydney on the, on the property market. I, I think it's completely um, just going to pass. The rental crisis is real, but once again, you just got to, it's a good thing for, for investors because if you've chosen the right property in the right area, you're just getting a huge amount of rental increase on your properties, which means they're cash flow positive. I mean, we've seen properties that were cash flow negative five years ago, um, townhouses off the plane in blue chip areas where the rental yield was 4%, now they're cash flow positive, well and truly, where they're giving people $100, $200 per week in their pocket after all expenses. So those people that have capitalised on these are laughing all the way to the bank. If you're trying to get into the market now, well, you won't get that uh, additional advantage because you're paying more, much more for the same property, which is the reality of the situation. Um, also, the, the Labor government is predicting that up to 650, and the numbers have been thrown around between 650 and 750,000 migrants are going to be coming into the country. Most of them, 56% to Melbourne, where all the jobs are. So that's going to put more pressure on already an unaffordable rental market and an unaffordable um, ownership market in Melbourne. <laughs> which means that if you've got properties, there's going to be more pressure on prices, which means you're going to get more capital growth and more rental yield appreciation on your portfolio, which is a good thing for investors. So all the things that are happening, guys, that the media always takes a negative spin on, I try to look at it objectively and say, what's the impact on my portfolio? And so far, everything has been positive. It's been the opposite of what I think that the media would like people to interpret it from. For me, I don't rent. Rent to increases means I get more money in my bank account. Um, you know, property shortage of houses, great. More pressure on the properties I own, which means they'll be valued more. So you've got to make sure that you, you take, you put things into perspective and in the context of investing rather than taking a look at things from a consumer perspective. So where are we currently in the property cycle? Well, as you know, the property cycle goes up and down. We have the peak of the market, we have the decline of the market, the bottom of the market, and the growth of the market. At the moment, Melbourne is here, according to Herring Todd White Valuers, right at the bottom, about to go into an upward trend and boom. And how do I know this? Do I make this stuff up? No, this is from the latest Herring Todd White Valuation Housing um, Cycle uh, Pie Graph, if you like. And you can see there, you can download this from the Herring Todd White website, htw.com.au. You can see Melbourne's at the bottom of the market going into a growth trend and Sydney's already taken there because obviously they're always in front of us going into the growth trade. The biggest growth we'll have is from 9 o'clock to 12 o'clock, okay? That's where the money is made. This is where things go crazy, where auction clearance rates go up to 90% and people just start paying ridiculous prices for properties. And remember, majority of the people get in here and then they'll lose money on the way down. The serious investors buy from 6 all the way to 12. If, if you want to time the market. The reality is, I buy all the way through the entire growth of the market. I don't really care about where we are. I look for the fundamentals of the property. And obviously, with property, you need to get a loan. Loans are complex. They require time, paperwork. You know, you can, like being an active investor is doing two or three or four transactions in a year and buying one or two properties. You know, it's, not, it's a very passive kind of an industry. Everything takes weeks and weeks. Getting a line of credit takes weeks. Getting a pre-approval takes weeks. Settling a property, you're looking at 60, 90 days. That's three months. So being active, we're talking about just a few transactions a year, well-timed transactions. Um, it's not something where with the stock market, we're going to open and close a position in seconds. The property market is very slow. It's a get rich very slowly kind of a deal. And by the way, every major capital city has its independent property clock. Not only that, to complicate things even further, we have a property clock on inner suburbs, metropolitan and regional. And those clocks could be doing different things at different times. So don't just think Victoria is one market or Melbourne's one market. Victoria is multiple markets and Melbourne has multiple dynamics to it. It's got eight distinctive markets. I always look at this situation and you can look at it whichever way you like. You can look at it as a half full glass or glass 
um, half empty. I look at it as half full. Positive. And I drink the water and that's it. I don't question it. Remember, 95% of the market is reactive, 5% responds. And the difference is your level of knowledge and awareness. Ultimately, you'll be placing yourself in, in either one of these categories, whether you like it or not. Either you're going to be blown around like a paper bag by the media, okay, and you're going to be reactive, or you're going to get educated and be responsive and know how to do, discern information, what's real, what's not, what's hype, and what's fake news, and then act accordingly. And remember, Warren Buffett says, be fearful when others are greedy, be greedy when others are fearful. Do the exact counter opposite of what everyone's doing because everyone gets things wrong and they arrive too late. Dollar cost averaging. It's an old strategy, but if you buy whenever you can buy, you're going to outperform majority of the market by timing the market. And that's what I've been doing since day one. I never had the luxury of timing the market. And when I understood how the market functions, by that stage, I already had an established property portfolio. I didn't need to time the market. And now that I know how to time the market, after 20 years plus in the same industry, I think timing the market is a completely useless exercise because it's so cumbersome to buy a property. There's so many things that can go wrong. No one could see 12 increases in interest rates two years ago coming. No one could predict that. No one did predict it, you know. But they came. They restricted... The average person on 78,000 PR, which is the average income in Victoria, their borrowing capacity was diminished by $150,000 to 200,000 based on the last 12 increases. So who could predict that? No one. So you know, in reality, if that person weighed to the bottom of the market, they would have found themselves with a diminished borrowing capacity at the bottom of the market and nothing really good to buy, which is a very disappointing place to be after all the time that, that you wasted. So I hope you enjoy this video, guys. A couple of things I want to share with you. So what's the next step? Number one is, ultimately, there's four types of behavior that, that, that I've observed that people have. One is the analytical compulsive information gatherer, which is usually a lot of engineering people. They just don't buy property. They keep paying huge amounts of tax every year. They do analysis to paralysis, and they just never get into the market. They're very smart people, and I think in their situation, they're almost too good too smart for their own good and they sabotage themselves. And there's a point where you just have to jump in and start buying properties um, rather than doing research for the next 10 years. There's also people that want to get rich quick, which definitely is a type of gamble. Look, property's not for you. Um, property's a very long-term game. In fact, you might get into a property and have no growth for two or three years. It's very common. And then have massive growth in year four or five. I've seen it happen with suburbs and properties in suburbs like Footscray, for example, there was stagnation for three years and suddenly you shut up, everything shut up by $150,000 overnight. So <clears throat> the get rich quick gambler, probably stick to the stock market and cryptocurrency or any other type of investment, but definitely not, not uh, property. Then there's the comforted zone investor, which is people that buy within three or four Ks of where they live. So they can drive by the property every day or every second day, look around, make sure it's still there, doesn't run off, doesn't disappear. Um, that's not a good methodology for building a property portfolio because unless you live in a really good growth suburb, it could work against you. Um, and there's the active, semi educated property investor. These are people that unemotionally develop a system and methodology for investing and they stick to it. And that's the people that I want to work with. And if you want to become that person, all you've got to do is get educated. So if you're interested in learning more, number one is I encourage you to attend my last event for the year which is the Real Estate Investing Fast Track Weekend. They book out really quickly. I do run around maybe 10 of these per year live in the office here um, just next door. I've got a seminar room for 60 people. So just jump onto our website and onto realestatefasttrack.com.au and reserve your seat there. Um, it's uh, very affordable. Uh, we run these events quite uh, often. Um, it's Cameron Fisher, Stephen McClutch from Loans Australia and myself. And uh, it's two-day jam-packed of information. Um, it's very affordable. It's $47, plus you get a hard copy of my book, which is Australian Real Estate Investing Made Simple. And this book really is like a manual for the two days. I mean, it's a more detailed version of the two days, but it's a reference manual for all the topics that we cover, from paying off your home in record time, how to identify hotspots, property cycles, etc. Also, just because you stay to the very end of this video, I encourage you to get your copy of a recording of the Fast Track Weekend. 
if you can't attend a live one. Now, obviously, it's going to be roughly 80% the same as a live version, except the property updates and the market updates would have been obsolete because it is a recording. But the rest of it is very, very much up to date with all the latest strategies in finance and property selection methodology. It's very user friendly. It's 15 hours. You get a 433 page manual and it's absolutely free and you can instantly access that immediately. Just scroll down below. There's a link just below this video. You'll see the link and then just click on the link, register your details and you're in and you're watching it and you're getting educated. And once again, there's no upsell. There's nothing behind this. You, to get into the first five properties, it's all you need. If you read the books, watch this two day online video course, you're going to have more information than 99% of all investors out there. And it's very user friendly. It's literally download the manual, click on play, and that's it. There's nothing to it. So that's my gift to you guys just for sticking around and watching this video. Um, and I hope you enjoyed it. I hope um, it serves you well. And if you get any results, please email me. I love reading emails of success stories from people that have watched my online course or read my books and have taken action. I received an email last week on Friday from a gentleman from Sydney that bought six townhouses, two in regional Sydney and two in the major, in, in Sydney in one of the suburbs using my system methodology. And uh, he's never come, been to a live event. He read both of my books and, and he also bought the online um, video course when it was available for purchase. And he just implemented and uh, he got results. So yeah, if you're getting results, I'd love to hear from you. Um, definitely send me an email. I love listening to those stories. Um, also, for those of you who want to have a strategy session with myself, I am doing a limited amount of 60 minute strategy sessions. Although I'm getting booked out now very severely and there's only a few of these that I'll be making available uh, in the future because I have so many clients that are working with me full time, I'm nearly at capacity. For those of you who want to have a free one hour session with me, uh, where I basically work out a plan, then, di then this is something definitely you can benefit from. It's a 60 minute strategy session uh, where I take an idea into a plan into action. And it's basically, the, the plan is everything guys. If you can do a really good plan, and this doesn't matter if it's property, if it's nutrition, weight loss, weight gain, powerlifting, bodybuilding, whatever you're doing, if you do a good plan, 50% of solving something is identifying it correctly, you know? And I'll be doing this for 20 years plus now so I can develop really good plans for clients who want to replace their incomes and build wealth with property investing. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. It's that simple. Okay, things are just not gonna magically happen. You have to make, you have to book yourself out. You have, to, you have to turn up, get the information, ring up the consultants, get the paperwork done. Things don't manifest magically. It's all about hard work and, and, and planning. But effectively what I do in consultation is rather than, than doing this is what most people do with their property portfolio, waste a lot of time and money. We go from A to B very quickly, whatever your B is. And B could be a different thing for, for different people. I have clients where the number one concern is tax. They're paying hundreds of thousands of dollars of tax per year and they're sick of it. I've got clients who are concerned about their retirement and they want to have passive income and they're coming up to you know, their 50s and they have nothing to show for it. They've only got one house, very little in their super, and they know that they can't stop working anytime soon, um, otherwise they'll run out of money. And I've got clients that are just naturally just curious about property and love property and they want to build up a large property portfolio, maybe to leave a legacy for their children or their future generations. Whatever your goal is, we can work out a strategy. So it's an hour with myself on Zoom um, or on the telephone. I work out where you are, where you want to be, and I do a whole plan for you. Uh, it's a personalized plan. I also give you an introduction to my whole team. Uh, so you get my mortgage broker, my accountant, my lawyer, which is really one of the secrets of wealth creation. I mean, there's no real secrets, but if there is a secret, it's surrounding yourself with very successful people that know what they're doing. It's going to make your job a lot and life a lot easier. And then you walk away with a real strategy, paint by the numbers. Like, you can't get this wrong. Like, do this, get this loan, buy this property. This is the result. It's that simple. So you've got to qualify for this as well because I do have a limited amount of spaces. And the properties that I source, the cheapest properties are around the 700, 750 mark now. I don't have anything below that. So for an individual, you need to have at least 95,000 income per year. Um, and have about $112,000 in savings in cash or equity in the property. And then you can qualify for a 700 purchase. 
Um, for a couple, you need to be roughly on 120 or 140 and have 112,000 or 126,000 in equity available to be drawn out. So you can at least get the first property. If you can't get the first property, guys, there's no point in doing a strategy session because you've got to start somewhere. It's like joining a gym without going to the gym, okay, and lifting weights. Like, you're going to have to lift weights, okay? So if you want to build a portfolio, you're going to have to buy properties. <laughs> without buying properties, you can't build a portfolio by definition. So there is a bit of a qualifying criteria, and it's getting harder and harder now because properties are getting more expensive. I'm virtually seeing nothing at 700 now. It's virtually like 750, 800. In the last 12 months, these properties that I'm sourcing have gone up by 50 to $100,000 just because construction has gone up. And remember, when construction goes up by 30%, who pays for it? The end buyer pays for it. This is what drives the market. So the driver of the market in the last 12 months has been more construction materials going up and fuel going up than consumer demand pushing up prices, you know, which is, which is really interesting. So for those of you interested, just simply send me an email to conrad at investorsprime.com.au. If you've been to a live event, just print off that form, send it to me, and I'll be in contact with you, and I'll book you in for a strategy session. Guys, that's it from me. Thank you very much. This is Conrad Bobulak. I'll see you on the inside.